Hello and welcome to the Eclipsing History Podcast, a podcast where we explore the history of eclipses through the diverse cultures of North America. This is Capturing Shadows, a bonus episode of our podcast focused on ancient camera technology. Stay with us as we learn about the camera obscura and how to even make one yourself. You can find our entire podcast at bgsu.edu slash eclipsing history. If you could just give us a brief introduction to, as to who you are and what you do. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. My name's Andrew Hirschberger. I am a photographic historian. I teach in the School of Art at BGSU. And uh, one of the very interesting things, in my opinion, about the history of photography is that um, cameras predate photography by a lot. And many people don't know that. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about why that is and how that came to be. Can you talk about the shared history of photography and the observation of eclipse? Again, I teach the history of photography, and uh, it's been a pleasure actually to learn this history, and I'm still a student in my own mind. I'm still learning. There's a lot to know. And one of the most fascinating things is definitely that um, cameras predate photography by a lot and maybe go all the way back to ancient times because the word camera actually literally means room. That's what the word camera means originally is room. So we are in a camera right now. We're in a room. It's not designed to um, make images inside this room. We're designed, you know, this room was designed to capture audio very well, and hopefully it is. Uh, But if you have a room, and many people have rooms, Uh, you can see images inside of it if you have a small hole that allows light in to the room. And ideally, the hole will be facing the outside. So in this room, we're kind of inside a room, inside of a room, so it'd be hard to do it in this room. But if we're in a room that has a wall that faces the outside, and if we were to drill a little hole in the wall, like maybe an eighth of an inch diameter hole, you would see inside the room, as long as every other source of light is blocked, so the room has to be totally dark other than this one little hole, you will see whatever is outside projected inside the room. It'll be upside down and reverse left to right because the light that's up high outside will come in through that hole and go down low. So the sky will be seen, and you will see the clouds on the floor, And you'll see other things that are up high on the floor. You'll see what's low, like people walking on the sidewalk outside. Their image will be projected on the ceiling. You will see people walking across the ceiling of your room. It's such a fascinating phenomenon. And that same phenomenon is happening inside of all of our eyes, too. The image that's on the back of our retina is upside down and reverse left to right because the light that's coming in from the right goes in to the left, and the light on the left comes into my eye and goes into the right, and low becomes high, high becomes low. So the image is always reversed, upside down and and backwards. And so all of us, our brains, are flipping these images right side up and correcting them left to right and then combining the two images in our eyes. So every camera, including this really nice old camera that I have from the late 1800s, it's basically a room, and inside the room you've got this little opening, which is now the lens. But you don't really need a lens. You just need a room. And this box camera uh, shows that the rooms just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And now we can fit the room in our pocket in our cell phone. But cell phones still have a little room inside of them where the light comes in and strikes a CCD. And that CCD is turning the image right side up and correcting it left to right before we look at it on the back of our phone. So in any case, the history of photography begins arguably with the first cameras, which were basically rooms. And some scholars have even argued that maybe caves were the first cameras because light sometimes comes in through those caves, through small openings, and it will create an image if it's coming through a small enough opening. And that's why, by the way, Aristotle and Euclid and and an Arab philosopher named Al-Hazan all the way back in the year uh, 1037, I think, Al-Hassan sees this phenomenon underneath trees, and it's happening because the sun is so bright, even during an eclipse, that um, just having like leaves that create a small opening, so sun comes through all these leaves and there's little openings, 
And all those little openings act like that hole in the wall. And that's why the image of the sun is projected onto the ground underneath trees is because there's all these little like apertures in a sense. And you don't need a dark room around the tree in order for it to work because the sun is so bright. Even when it's being eclipsed, it's almost as if you, you don't care that there are no walls blocking the rest of the light because the image of the sun is so intense. You can see it without you know, blocking the, the rest of the light. So that's kind of a long answer to your question. But the history of photography goes all the way back to you know, very, very early times if we connect it to the history of cameras, which again are rooms originally. That is so fascinating. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, I had no yeah. idea that that was um, <clears throat> conceptually how that worked. That okay, is so yeah. fascinating. Thank you. Um, you mentioned um, that some Arab scholars were really important in the yeah. development of, um, you know, eclipse science. I was wondering if you could speak more to maybe how multiple different cultures were involved in this history. Well, yeah, I think... It could be the case that, you know, it's going to be the case that all cultures have rooms. And that would be my assumption of some kind. And so, you know, if you have a space that is relatively enclosed or maybe totally enclosed and you have imperfections in that space, you're going to see light. Light will do this. And by the way, I love to tell my students this. You all probably, you know, have rooms that you live in, and you can make a camera obscura in your apartment, in your dorm, in your home, wherever it is. All you have to do is darken the room completely and then create a little hole. It doesn't have to be a lens. You don't need a lens of any kind. You just need a hole. So if you have a window that faces the outside world uh, in a room, just darken the rest of the room completely. And that means putting a towel like under your door and maybe up above. If there's big openings that let light in, you need to block all the other sources of light and just allow a little bit of light in through one opening. And it doesn't have to be open to the air. So you could have a window with just a little you know, opening that you allow light into your room. You will see this anywhere in the world. It cannot not happen. You know, Light will come in the way that it does. And so you're going to see images. And it is magical. I'm telling you, I've seen it many times myself, but I never tire of this phenomenon. And one of the things that I also know about camera obscuras is that when the sun is present in like if if my window with my little opening is able to, in a sense, see the sun, like if the sun is out there in that direction inside the room, that's going to be the only thing I can see is the sun because it's so incredibly bright. It blocks my ability to see all of the other image. And the image is everywhere in the room. It's on the floor, on the walls, on the ceiling. It covers everything outside the room. But if the sun is out there, you're not going to see the rest of this image because the sun's brilliance is going to block your ability to perceive all the other image. So most people that, like me, want to make a photograph inside of a camera, you typically don't want to include the sun because it's intensely bright light blocks your ability to see everything else, basically. So when you're inside your you know, apartment or inside your room, uh, hopefully some days you'll be able to see the sun because then you're going to get this bright image of the sun in your room. But hopefully other days you won't have the sun out there because then you'll see like people walking on your ceiling and stuff like that that you won't be able to perceive if the sun is coming in to your room through that little opening. So, yeah, it's a very fun phenomenon. One of my students, I love to tell this story too, one of my former students who's now the assistant curator, actually the full curator, believe it or not, of photography at the Dayton Art Institute in Dayton, a student named Maria Postalwaite. I'll never forget when she first saw the inside of the camera obscura that we have in the School of Art. Uh, when she first saw this phenomenon, she blurted out, oh my God, I'm so happy. And that just made me so happy too. It's like, wow, that's exactly how I feel still today. Every time I'm inside of a camera obscura and seeing this amazing phenomenon that all of us should really be familiar with because it's happening inside of all of our eyes, but we just don't really realize it, I guess. Uh, it's an amazing thing to see in person. So I highly recommend that all of you make a camera inside your room and all you have to do again is block out all the light except for a little opening. You don't need a lens, you don't need technology of any kind and it will happen inside your room. And you will not forget it, I can tell you that. 
I love the idea of the camera obscura. That's so fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating. And, you know, I don't know how much more information you want, but I, I did bring in a bunch of stuff, including this article by Don Ida. And Ida argues that the camera obscura invents modern science. This is an oh. article from 2008, and it's a very interesting thought. Um, so uh, the history of cameras might be the beginnings of photography, and according to him, at least, it's also the beginnings of modern science. And so lots of scientists use cameras, and artists like Leonardo da Vinci, who was also a scientist, he was using camera obscuras to help him with his drawings, both in terms of scientific drawings and in terms of, of um, art. You know, he was an artist as well, a painter and a, and a drawer and a sculptor. Uh, so many, many people over time have used cameras in a variety of ways to assist them with making images and pictures and paintings and so on. And so photography inherits a long history of camera use uh, that predates the official introduction of photography as we know it today. Oh, that is so fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun history. That's yeah. why I'm teaching it, because I love sharing this information. Yeah, because you always think of photography as situated within the art realm, but yeah. it is a form of scientific observation as yeah. well. Oh, yeah. I think it's a little bit of both. It's kind of an interesting mixture of art and science mm -hmm. together, yeah. I was thinking about something when you were um, explaining um, the way the camera works and creating a hole. Yeah. So I was trying to think of shadows also. Is it the same idea or it's kind of different from, you know, the camera obscura thing? One of the inventors of photography was a, a man in England. And the history of photography is super cool, in my opinion. So photography is invented around 1839. So a lot of what we've been talking about predates that a long way, like going back 2,000 plus years, if we're talking about Aristotle and, and Al-Hazan and other people. So uh, Aristotle's you know, knowledge of cameras is something that happens a lot longer ago than 1839. But the official invention of photography happens around 1839 with three people. Two of them are really probably the most important. Uh, one is William Henry Fox Talbot. William Henry Fox Talbot is the English inventor of photography. He designs what becomes known as the negative-positive process in the history of photography. And Talbot was using cameras, very much like this one. He was using little box cameras because they were well-known. They were being used by people like Leonardo da Vinci a lot longer ago, you know, in the 1400s and 1500s in da Vinci's case. So cameras were well known by the time people like Talbot started thinking about trying to create an image using light sensitive material like silver nitrate and so on. But Talbot, to answer your question about shadows, Talbot has this great idea that what he invented is the art of fixing a shadow. That's what he calls it in his first announcement to the world in 1839. He calls his invention the art of fixing a shadow. So he thought, exactly like you were thinking, that not only is it light that's being captured by these cameras, and again, you don't need any fancy equipment. You know, this is kind of fancy, actually, as a camera compared to a box. But I wanted to bring this little box camera in because it's so simple compared to other cameras today. You know, this is a one... Uh, kind of shot um, photographic camera. And so you've got a very simple box camera here, but the ones that Talbot was using were even simpler by far. So just a box with a little opening. Sometimes he would use a lens too. So you've got lens cameras at that point as well, but you don't need to have a lens. You just need to have a small hole and that will create the image on the back of his camera. And he was one of the people that put in light sensitive material in the back of the camera and that way he captures, you know, this shadowy image or this light and shadow image on the back of the camera. And then he can develop it and fix it and show it to other people. That's, be, you know, that's what we think of as photography, you know, today. Uh, so it's people like Talbot back in 1839 with the art of fixing a shadow. Thank you so much for joining us. This was amazing. Your expertise was very enlightening. Well, thank you. It's we really appreciate fun. it. I love talking about this stuff, so thank you all. Yes, thank you. Thank you for listening to Eclipsing History. Landon Cena composed the original music for the podcast. Ohio Humanities provided financial support. 
To access other episodes and additional content, go to bgsu.edu slash eclipsinghistory.